Gypsy 206, Tomcat, come on, manual. Manual pass. Ball 5.2. Roger, ball. We've got 25 knots down the angle. They did a physiology study of Navy pilots during actual combat missions. They measured things like pulse rate, heartbeat, adrenaline flow, and breathing patterns. And they found that the needle quivered most when the pilots came back to land on the deck of the aircraft carrier. Putting 20 tons of airplane on a patch of heaving, rolling carrier deck created more tension and pressure than dodging surface-to-air missiles, even among the most experienced pilots. It's probably the single biggest test of airmanship, and flight crews make no pretense about it either. Even with the self-confidence inherent in all good pilots, men who fly their aircraft to the limits of its performance and stake their lives on their own flying ability, even these pilots long remember their carrier landings. Especially in bad weather, with ceilings down to a hundred feet, visibility maybe half a mile, and you're making a carrier control approach. Although you're under positive control of the ship at all times, except for the final phase when the landing signal officer takes over, it's the most demanding kind of flying. At night, it's even tougher. You're looking for a pattern of light about three quarters of a mile ahead to set up your approach. If you hit a gust of wind, the airplane will climb or descend on you, and you've got to make a glide slope correction or go around again. Sometimes it's so black you can't believe it. No stars, no moon, and you're hundreds of miles at sea. With no reference, you lose all depth perception. It's as if you were going down a mine shaft or into a closet and closing the door behind you. It's a special kind of flying that takes a special kind of pilot and a special kind of airplane. It takes intensive training, experience and confidence. An accommodation of man and machine. A blending of skill and structure. Navy pilots and airplanes with sea legs. Much has been written of the carrier task force and the evolution of the carrier itself as a self-sustaining weapon system that is the heart of naval aviation. A city at sea with over 5,000 men, enough supplies to last six months to a year, and over 80 aircraft filling a variety of roles that continues to grow in the face of new technologies and new threats. With the current CV concept, which combines attack and ASW capabilities in a single hull, today's carriers must handle a variety of aircraft, all of which require different staff expertise, more spares and ground support equipment. Carriers have gotten bigger, of course, but so have the aircraft. The Essex class has been replaced by the larger Forrestal class and nuclear carriers. F-4s are gradually being replaced by F-14s. Aircraft and platform enhance and at the same time limit each other. Yet the fact remains that Navy aircraft do not compromise performance or compatibility with the carrier. Consider that the Navy F-4 and A-7 have been eminently successful as primary weapon systems for the U.S. Air Force. On the other hand, no aircraft designed for land operations has ever been converted for carrier duty. It takes more than a tail hook to earn your sea legs. No matter what its mission or performance, a carrier aircraft is a special breed. For one thing, it's built to survive in an environment land-based aircraft were never designed to tolerate. Launched from a steam-powered catapult that induces an acceleration loading better than five times the force of gravity 
and yanked off the deck in a couple of hundred feet. As one pilot put it, it's like you're inside a slingshot and you're in tension, waiting. Then they let go and you're shot into space like a little BB. You go from zero to 160 knots in two and a half seconds with no runway left over. Once airborne, performance varies with the specific aircraft and the mission at hand. A typical mix on the CV today calls for three attack squadrons, two fighter squadrons, early warning, reconnaissance and electronic countermeasure aircraft, as well as the means to counter the growing submarine threat. It's a total maritime responsibility. Since the carrier operates a safe distance from shore and can move 50 miles or so between launch and recovery, each airplane must carry additional fuel to complete its mission and get back to the ship. And each airplane must also carry enough gas to give pilots a few extra shots at the deck, if need be. Getting back on the carrier is indeed the ultimate challenge. It's precision flying, but no one even pretends to be a soft lander. You fly until the deck comes up and you hit it in what has loosely been described as a controlled crash, immediately applying full engine power in case you fail to snatch the wire. A 50-ton pull on the tail hook brings the airplane to a jolting halt. Everything wants to keep going forward, and for a second or two you think it will. But the backlash quickly nulls itself out. That's the way it was designed. A carrier airplane is a rigid structure, but like all structures, distorts under load. It twists and bends every time it leaves the deck and every time it returns. You can't see it, but when the landing gear hits, the whole fuselage bends momentarily under the impact, and the wing tips want to reach down to the deck. The gear itself literally springs back after impact and imparts a reverse loading on the structure. Quite a difference from land-based aircraft, which descend at a reasonably flat angle and flare into a smooth landing with runway in front of them as far as the eye can see and a little extra help when you need it. By comparison, a carrier landing calls for a slow, steep approach with engines and flight systems synchronized for maximum controllability. Exceptional over-the-nose visibility is essential to pick out the visual landing aid system, or meatball, and to establish the correct lineup so critical for safe landing. The aircraft must also be especially responsive to changes in thrust and attitude. And slow approach speeds are desirable because they give the pilot more time to make corrections. Coming in at 115 knots instead of 140, say, might not seem like much. But the fact is, every knot counts. And slower is safer. Carrier airplanes use about 10% of the runway required by land-based aircraft and are designed to hit the deck at sink speeds up to 25 feet per second, about three times the speed and nine times the impact energy of a typical land-based aircraft. To take these kinds of loads requires a heavy-duty landing gear and supporting structure. An arresting hook system integrated with the fuselage to withstand a deceleration force up to six G's on some aircraft and a fatigue life that will see the entire structure safely through some 6,000 carrier landings. Before ever getting to the carrier, of course, individual airplanes are subjected to rigorous static, fatigue and dynamic tests to verify structural integrity from zero load to failure. Then flight testing, low speed handling, touch and goes, high speed cruise and maneuvering through the aircraft's entire operating envelope. 
Carrier suitability tests at the Navy facility at Patuxent River, Maryland, and Lakehurst, New Jersey, include everything from catapult launches and arrested landings at various conditions and engaging speeds to barricade arrestments. For all the differences between carrier and land-based aircraft, it's hard to tell one from the other by just looking. Internal design and structure separate the two more than anything else. Except for a few things like the arresting hook, maybe the canted windshield, launch bar and holdback links. But essentially, it's a matter of overall inherent strength. And oh yes, the wings fold on most carrier aircraft. With just so much square footage to work with, everything that goes on a carrier, including the aircraft, is packaged as compactly as possible. Space is always a problem, particularly when it comes to maintenance, most of which is confined to a hangar deck that precludes the use of much of the big support and handling equipment found at a typical airport. In such tight quarters, easy access becomes even more critical to simplify inspections and minimize downtime. There are many other features peculiar to carrier aircraft. Maintaining static balance, for example, to prevent tip back during deck handling. Providing integral crew boarding features to eliminate ladders and work stands on the deck. Using special alloys and sealants to protect the aircraft against the high humidity and salt spray environment so conducive to corrosion. Designing engine inlets to minimize ingestion of hot catapult steam and ejection seats that afford safe egress at ground level and zero speed. In terms of performance, the requirement to fly slowly demands good handling characteristics. The high lift devices and moderate wing loading, that is the bigger wing essential to lower speeds, also means better than average maneuverability. The payoff, an all-weather attack bomber like the A6 can handle itself pretty well in a tight turn. Similarly, the F-14 uses a straight, unswept wing to achieve low takeoff and landing speeds and low speed maneuverability. And a highly swept wing for supersonic flight. As a result, the Navy has an airplane designed for fleet defense, yet equally effective for close-in air-to-air combat. Of course, no aircraft with sea legs is going to be effective without people with sea legs to manage the system. The right people in the right place at the right time. From the first drawings off the board, to the first operating system, to the first carrier landing, and into an environment that might well be the best organized and most efficient military system ever put together. It's the aircraft that make the carrier viable, but it's the pilots who pay it off. And right from the start, Navy tailhook pilots think they're better than anyone else, and who's to say they're not? Yet they're only as good as the men who maintain the aircraft, the technicians who groom the weapons gear, the mechanics who watch over the engines, the plane captains who see that they're ready for flight, the handling officer who spots them on the deck, and the air boss who tells them when to come and when to go. It's a community like no other, dedicated men putting their skills on the line every day, moving these airplanes with sea legs on and off the ship continuing readiness.